This is a very powerful presentation today. If you need to leave, we have resources in the back of the room. It is now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Kristen Christie. Life has thrown a lot of challenges at Kristen Christie, but she has turned tragedy into advocacy. Kristen volunteers in many capacities nationwide. Because of her advocacy, she was a guest at the State of the Union Address this year. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a privilege to present to you today, Kristen Christie. Life is a tough teacher. We get the test first, and then we learn the lesson. When I heard that quote from Vernon Law, the author, it was an aha moment for me. In my 39 years, plus shipping and handling of life, <laughs> expedited shipping, if you will, <laughs> it helped me to review those things in my life, those events in my life that were really tests. And some of them were pop quizzes, and some felt like finals. But it was an aha moment for me, and today I just want to talk about a few of the tests that I've gone through in life. And hopefully, it, something resonates with you. But it's all about community. As human beings, we want to be protected, respected, and connected. And I want to talk about the connection today. So I am very fortunate to be a product of the Air Force. My dad was 32 years in the Air Force, and we moved every 24 months, two years at a location all over the world. So we would pack up, we would move, we would make it a home on the installation. We would do the inventory. Whose stuff did we get? Or what stuff was broken, right? It always happens. But we got embedded in our communities because that was a mantra that our parents had instilled in me and my younger brother. We got embedded in our community and it was all about being connected and proactive because that community would come alongside of us when we needed it the most. And we were part of other people's community. But whether it was Okinawa, Japan or Omaha, Nebraska, San Vito, Italy, or San Antonio, Texas, we would get settled, and my brother and I would sit in the back seat with the Rand McNally map. It was way before GPS. And we would tell my parents where to turn. We would get lost in our cities, in our communities. The other thing my parents instilled in us was, if you don't ask, the answer is always no. If you ask, you have a chance. If you have a chance, take it. And if it changes your life, let it. And that has come back to help us so many times. In 1983, I was 15 years old and a junior in high school. We had just moved to Wiesbaden, Germany. We were getting embedded in our community. At 15 years old, my schedule was I would wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning, I would go to tennis practice, I would go to my junior year in high school, and then go to golf practice because it was golf season. See, I'm a type AAA plus, plus, plus. I'm an uber extrovert. I can walk into the room and suck the air right out of an introvert's lungs. And I have to temper that. But I was driven. I'm sure my parents would have rather stayed in bed at 4 a.m. in the morning. It was not what they wanted. But that was what I wanted. So in October of 83, that hard work that I put in, that effort that I put into it, paid off. The first week in October of 1983, I played Steffi Graf in tennis, and I beat her. Steffi Graf was 14 years old and 98th in the world of tennis. I was 15 and unranked. It was fabulous. That hard work that I put in, was paying off. The second week in October of 1983, I was still riding high on that win. I won the golf championship for all the DOD high schools in Germany. And I beat the number one boy by five strokes. <laughs> I didn't get a medal for that one, <laughs> but I was pretty darn proud of that. My hard work was paying off. The last week in October, nine days before my 16th birthday, I experienced a massive stroke. 
not a golf stroke, not a tennis stroke, a massive physical stroke. I was born with a malformed vein in the very center of my brain that burst. It was an ABM. The prognosis was, if I lived, I would never walk again. Our community came alongside of us when we needed them the most. We had been in Germany for two months, but my Sunday school teacher was a doctor, and his roommate at the Air Force Academy had been, was the number one neurosurgeon at Wolford Hall. See, Longstuhl was not equipped to take care of me because it was six days after the Beirut bombing of the Marine Corps barracks. Those doctors were tag teaming in the hallway. But my community rallied around and they got me aerovac to Wolford Hall. I endured a nine hour surgery. The prognosis was she'll probably live, but she'll never walk again. I don't take no for an answer. Our community came alongside when I got back to Germany after surgery because I had to learn to crawl again. My friends would come over to the house after school and we would have crawling races. Just because I had had a stroke, my competitiveness did not go away. I was still competitive. I wanted to win those crawling races. I was gonna prove those doctors wrong. But I also went through a depression. Besides physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, I had to go to therapy because I was depressed. I had lost my identity. My identity was based on my athleticism. I was a good student, but I had lost it. My brain was working, but my body wouldn't follow what my brain was saying. So my parents understood when I said, as we're driving down the Audubon at 125 miles an hour, I said, I wanted to open up this car door and jump out. I verbalized it to them and they understood that I needed other help. And it did. It, my, my counselor helped me find new avenues for my talents because I couldn't see them myself. A year and a half after my stroke, I walked across the stage to pick up my high school diploma. It was the first time without a cane or a walker. It took hard work. It was exhausting just brushing my teeth after surgery. But I didn't do it alone. I wasn't a lone survivor. But life is a tough teacher. We get the test first and then we learn the lesson. And I learned a lot of lessons during that test, that final, if you will. It felt like a final. I learned what hard work can really do. I learned how important our community was and how deep my faith ran. Because I would need those three things later on in life. So my scholarships were taken away for tennis and golf, but I received a full scholarship to the University of Texas in Austin because my dad was a Texas resident. So I go from Wiesbaden, Germany to Austin, Texas, 53,000 students in 1985 when I went. It was the largest university population-wise back then. Now, as an uber extrovert, I get my energy from people. If you leave here exhausted, I have your energy. Come see me. <laughs> but I needed to find my community. I had lived on installations my entire life. Where was my community? The ROTC building. See, I wasn't able to raise my right hand to take the oath of service, but I was able to raise my left hand and volunteer where I could in my community with people who spoke my language in acronyms. <laughs> so I volunteered to be in Angel Flight, which is Silver Wings now, Arnold Air Society at the University of Texas at Austin. So my junior year in, high, in college, I went to a party and there was one person in the room I did not know, and it bothered me. So guess what? I walked right over to him and I said, hi, I'm Kristen Anderson. He stepped back a little bit because I guess I was a little too much. And he said, hi, I'm Don Christie. We can never get married. <laughs> Go on, what kind of pickup line is that? 
he saw the confused look on my face and he said, you would be Kristen Christie. Did I tell you I don't take no for an answer? <laughs> there was something in his eyes that drew me to him. Five months later, I had a ring on my finger. <laughs> Two years later, we were married after he was commissioned into the Air Force as a missileer. So our first assignment was Grand Forks, North Dakota. Uh-huh, mm-hmm. In Grand Forks, North Dakota, living on base, you want to get embedded in your community. We left our front doors open. We left our garage doors open during the summer, not during the winter, but our community could come and take whatever they needed. But you know what? When we, I call them the TDY gremlins, he was a missileer. He would pull alert. Guess what would happen when he's gone? <laughs> Things happen. Our basement flooded. I was eight months pregnant with our oldest son, Ryan, and he was pulling alert. Our neighbors came alongside to help me. Not only did the batteries in our smoke detectors chirp at 2 a.m., they exploded. And he was TDY. <laughs> our community came alongside to help us. And we were part of other people's community. Now, I've said community a lot. It's almost been 10 minutes and I've said community a lot. And each and every one of you has a different definition of what your community is. It could be your unit, your squadron, where you work. It could be your church. It could be your neighborhood. It could be your Texas Hold'em group you meet with once a month. Whatever your community is to you, I want you to think about your community when I talk about it. But we got embedded in that community. It was great. We were there for four years. And then we got an assignment right here to Colorado Springs in 1995. Now, Schriever Air Force Base was Falcon Air Station back then. And he was going to be a satellite operator at three stops out there. And it was the first time that we had lived off base. We bought our home for the first time. And we were ambassadors to our community, our neighborhood, for the military. But we also got embedded in our community out at Schriever. And that was important to us. So we were here for two years. And in 1997, Don came home and he said, you know what, Kristen? My career is not going the way I want it to. And I think I need to separate from the Air Force. <laughs> now, I talk about my identity as an athlete. My identity was also in my ID card. <laughs> when I was 10 years old, we were at Maxwell Air Force Base. My dad was at Air War College. And we went to go get my ID card, and I went straight to the shop at, and I made them card me. <laughs> but that was part of my identity. He said, hold on. And he told me about the Air Force Reserve. It was the best of both worlds for us. And back then in 97, when he joined the reserve as a traditional reservist, we could homestead. So we built a custom home here in Colorado Springs, our forever home. <laughs> I laugh. You, you all know, right? <laughs> in the Air Force, nothing's permanent. Things change. You roll with the punches. But we bought, we, we built our custom home and we thought we were going to be here. Don's goal in active duty was to be a lieutenant colonel and a squadron commander. That was his goal. And he knew going the active duty route, that wasn't going to happen. But it could happen in the, on the reserve route. See, he had a goal. He had a chance and he took it. And he joined the Air Force Reserve. And we really thought it was the best of both worlds. And in fact, this is where community comes alongside. And together, we can make a difference. When he joined the Reserve, we got a new ID card, pink, my favorite color. That was fine. But we also got a green card. It was a 12-punch card. We could only go to the commissary 12 times a year. So as a young spouse living on military installations, I love the commissary and the BX. And I said, you know, we're currently serving. So I was one of the youngest on a, a group of people that got together and we lobbied Congress to give us unlimited commissary services for those currently serving. The next year we got a 24 punch card. <laughs> we said, thank you very much, however, comma. We went back up, and the next year, we got unlimited services. That is the power of your community. When you find a gap, come together, because you're not a lone survivor. We aren't made to do life alone. 
and we made something happen. And we loved Colorado Springs. And Don became a squadron commander as a major. He was a squadron commander of 19 SOPs out at Schriever, the largest reserve squadron at the time in Air Force Reserve Command. And they, they run the GPS satellite, the AKA Rand McNally of, you know, current times. But he came home in 2003 as the squadron commander. He said, Kristen, I have been tasked with getting volunteers for a deployment in Baghdad. And I don't feel right asking for volunteers unless my name is at the top of the list. That's when I knew he was a leader. I had heard from other people he was a great leader. That's when I knew he was a leader. A supervisor or a manager says go. A leader says let's go. And Don said, let's go. And he was the only one chosen for that deployment. In April of 2004, off to Baghdad he went, and he was second in command at the Baghdad airport. The boys and I did not watch TV. We would email him at the end of our day, and typically the next day or two days later, we would have an email back from him in the morning before we went to school. It was before Skype, Facebook. But we didn't want to watch TV. We didn't want to know because we didn't know what was going on over there. We didn't have a frame of reference. But, you know, he would call and say, I got to meet the Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld, on the tarmac. Or Ted Nugent signed my gun holster when he was coming through on a USO tour. But he came home with the Bronze Star, and I know that you don't earn the Bronze Star by having Toby Keith take a nap on your couch. And he came home after four and a half months, and we hear it during pre-deployment and during deployment and post-deployment, he came back different. That twinkle in his eyes that pulled me to him in that room our junior year in college wasn't there. His fingernails were bitten down to the nubs. He was more withdrawn than typical, staying up all night. And I knew something was wrong. And I tried to communicate that. And he tried to communicate with me, but there were things that he couldn't talk about. And it wasn't, it wasn't related to clearances. Just he couldn't verbalize it. And we called those sacred spaces. I had sacred spaces, too. There were things that I didn't want to tell him about, you know, while he was gone to burden him. So we just came to an understanding that there were sacred spaces in our lives that um, we just couldn't verbalize to each other. But then I thought our saving grace came when he was picked up for Army War College in Carlisle Barracks. When my dad went to Air War College, we went with him as a family, and it was a great family time. It was a time to, to reintegrate with one another, rejuvenate, recharge, and I thought that was our saving grace. But we were told we were going to the Pentagon after. So we sold our custom home here in Colorado Springs. And we went on because we had new chapters and we had new communities to get embedded in. And off to Carlisle Barracks we went and I was so excited because I was going to learn Army E's. In fact, I did a Joint Forces Dictionary for our spouses. MOS equals AFSC. It was a lot of fun. I became bilingual. <laughs> <laughs> but we met wonderful people. And after War College, we all spread across the globe. But we got embedded in that community, and so our heartstrings were embedded with one another as we moved. And six weeks before graduation, the Air Force came back and said, we change our mind. Shocker. Cadets, get ready. Right? It's going to happen. You, you roll with the punches. And they said, we need you back in Colorado Springs. Our mindset was not there. We were ready to go to the Pentagon. We were ready to forge forward, but we came back. And guess what? If you don't ask, the answers always no. So I went to our home that we built, and I rang the doorbell, and I asked if we could buy our house back. <laughs> the answer was no. <laughs> but I'll talk about that in a little bit, <laughs> what that meant. But it was a really hard move for me and Don. The boys reintegrated. They went to their school. They went back to the school that they had just left. They reintegrated into the community really well. 
But Don and I had a tough time. It was really rocky for us. And I likened it to a double dutch jump rope where you have both ropes going at the same time and you're trying to track so you can jump in without tripping. But we tripped. In April of 2008, the coroner came to my house with two officers. Don had taken his life three days before he pinned on Colonel. I'd heard the word catatonic before, but I saw it that night in my boy's eyes. They were 14 and 12. And all I remember saying is, my poor boys, my poor boys. But the choice that Don made has lasting effects, not just for our family, for our, for our communities. Ben, our youngest, was 12. Eight years later, on his 20th birthday, I woke up to this voicemail. in my baby's voice. That was eight years later. Ben attempted suicide that night. He was at the University of Arizona in Tucson. I was in Colorado. His roommates came alongside and got him the help that he needed. But as a mom, I felt helpless. Our oldest son, Ryan, was 14 when Don decided to take his life. This is what I have from Ryan. We are not having technical difficulties. My oldest son has been missing for 1,613 days today. That's four years, four months, 30 days. What we didn't know was Ryan was bipolar and the suicide triggered his bipolar early from what we understand. He's also attempted suicide. Now, I'm a mom. I'm not a licensed therapist. I don't have letters behind my name, but sometimes I feel like a SME in overcoming. I'm a woman of faith. I stand on a firm foundation and I am daughter of the king. And our faith gets us through. But as a mom, I pray that my oldest son is on this side of heaven. I just want to know. So this is what's left of our family. Because of a choice. Now, I think suicide's contagious. From a layperson's perspective. But I want to talk about what else is contagious. The power of a smile and a kind word and using someone's name. You all have name tags. If you work in the service industry, you've got name tags. If you don't know how to pronounce someone's name, ask them. See their face light up because you see them. We talk about identity, right? 
my parents named me Kristen. I married into Christy. When people say Kristen, Christy, and they don't have to get it right, <laughs> a lot don't, and it's okay. But they see me as a person. They see you as a person. Use the person's name, the power of a kind word, of a smile, and using someone's name. About a week after we buried Don, I took the boys to Panera Bread. And Jerry was 19 years old behind the cash register. And I knew his name was Jerry because he had a name tag on. And we ordered and he said, ma'am, I really like your hair. I lost it. This poor kid was like, oh my gosh, what did I do? I had tears, I had snot running down my nose. And then a booger bubble burst all over the cash register. I offered to clean it up. And I said, Jerry, you have no idea what me and my family are going through. And that one sentence has made all the difference in the world. Because you know what? Life is a cruel teacher. We get the test first and then we learn the lesson. There's also another saying that it takes nothing away from a burning candle to light another candle. It takes no wax, no wick, no fire. If you have one candle, whose candle are you today? Today, I'm not talking, today, whose candle are you? That you can share your light and illuminate someone's world because we don't know the battles that we all are waging. You know, we're at war. We're on an emotional battlefield and there is no room for strangers on this battlefield. There is no room for silence on this battlefield. We were not made to do life alone. We are not lone survivors. So whose candle are you? So we live in a world of acronyms. I, I want to share some acronyms with you that have helped me and my family, and they still do. No, I told you I don't take no for an answer, but if you're a supervisor or a manager or a parent, <laughs> no is an answer. It just means next opportunity. And because you don't know what the person is going through, no can be a gut punch on the receiving end. So if you can spend a little bit of time with them, to help them understand what the next opportunity is, what new avenues for their talents are. It takes nothing away from your burning candle. It doesn't take much time at all. But as supervisors, I, I encourage you, a leader will help people find the next opportunity. The next one is fly. First, love yourself. We hear this on the airplane, right? And in society, put your oxygen mask on before you help others. And it just means that you're no good to other people, to people in your community, your battle buddy, if you don't take care of yourself first. Because guess what? When you fly, you can fight and win. See what I did there, people? The army doesn't really get it when I talk to them. <laughs> I'm Air Force through and through. But when you take care of yourself, you can fight, fight and win. PTG, we hear PTS. Post-traumatic or post-test growth. What are those lessons you learn from those tests and from the traumas from the adversities? You know, we go through adversities in life and that helps with perseverance and it, it, it creates perseverance and then the perseverance creates character and character creates hope. And because there's hope for tomorrow, there's power in today. But think about the lessons that you learn. Don't stay and wallow in those adversities for very long. I'm not saying get out of it right away. You know, we talk resiliency. A lot of people think it's about bouncing back, and I did at first. But the problem with bouncing back, if you think of Bozo the Clown that had sand at the bottom, you blew him up and you punched him, he would bounce back, but he was in the same spot. I don't want to be in the same spot. I want to get through it. When you're going through hell, keep on going. That country song, I'm not going to sing it for you. You're welcome. <laughs> but I challenge you to look through your rear view mirror because someone's coming through a hell. It's not exactly the same as yours, but they're going to need the lessons that you learned from your test. 
four letter word, fail. I feel like I failed as a mom and as a spouse. And it was my counselor who helped me understand that fail stands for first attempt in learning or further attempt in learning, never final attempt in learning. When you go to bed tonight, you're gonna learn lessons today. I want you to think about those lessons that you learned. We're gonna make mistakes in life and we are gonna fail. But what are the lessons we learn? Fear. I have a lot of fear. And some fear is healthy. And I'm not saying be fearless, but it's false evidence appearing real. If you shared with your partner or the person next to you what your fear was, I bet you it wouldn't be the same. You two wouldn't have the same fears. But it takes your community to help remove that veil to help you find new avenues for your talents and to get over that fear. Because to the person next to you, your fear probably doesn't seem realistic. But a lot of times we see in others more than what we see in ourselves in the mirror. Free, I coined this one and I love it, foster relationships energetically everywhere. Now, I'm not saying you have to be a tigger and come bounding into a room suck the air right out of an introvert's lungs like I do sometimes. But when you foster those relationships and use the person's name, even for that one moment, it means the world. We each have a sphere of influence and when we bring someone into that sphere of influence, their sphere of influence becomes our community as well. And we help each other through that. The last one is hope, hold on, pain, eases. Some people say, hold on, pain ends. I think you'll understand when I say our pain won't end. But I have people who ease the pain in my life. And I hope that I am someone's capital E in hope in their life. So a few things that our neighbors in our community did for us after the coroner left, I mean directly after and still 12 years later, they showed up. I made one phone call, and our living room and kitchen were full of people, and I remember every single person who was there. I don't remember what they said, but you know what? They did something. It doesn't say, say something. It says, do something. Whatever you feel comfortable doing. My best friend and her two boys were my boy's best friend. She pulled them out of school and stayed with us for three days. And she slept on Dawn's side of the bed so it wouldn't be empty. She showed up and she did something. I had a friend from Army War College who lived in Florida. She didn't call. She rang the doorbell with a suitcase in her hand. She had flown from Florida to Colorado Springs to stay with us. She showed up and she did something. A friend of ours broke, literally broke into our house the day after the coroner left and was making pancakes. She didn't ask because I would have told her I hate pancakes. <laughs> but they were the best tasting pancakes I've ever had because they were made with love and I wasn't gonna be rude and not eat her pancakes. And then they were intentional. Be intentional. If someone is on your heart or in your head, be intentional right then and there. Stop what you're doing. Pull the car over into a safe you know, parking lot. If you're in a skiff, get out of the skiff. Take a break. Pull your cell phone out and text them because they need to hear from you. Follow that calling to be intentional and then use your resources. We used our resources and guess what? I didn't have the resources ahead of time. If you have a cell phone and want to take pictures of this slide, please do. But these are some of the resources, national resources. The suicide hotline, it comes under a number of different names. It is the same number. The veterans crisis line, the military crisis line. But our senators in Colorado, Senator Bennett and Senator Gardner, I've been working with them on getting a three-digit number. We have 911 in a medical emergency. In a mental health crisis or an emotional emergency, eventually, it's not active yet, we'll have 988. But there are a number of resources for you. Military One Source is global. We have the assistance, uh, the employee assistance program. And if you'd rather text, like my son, when he calls me, I know something's wrong. 
He would rather text. If you'd rather call, if you'd rather text, if you'd rather be online, there are resources for you available. And it's not just for you when you're in a crisis, but when someone in your community is in a crisis, they're going to need your help. So I talked about hope. Hold on, pain eases. This is my husband, Sean. We met on Match.com. It works. <laughs> and when we met, he was a Navy reservist. I blew that sucker up. I'm a recruiter, too. He's been my E. His mom was a psychiatric nurse for 40 years. His brother is schizophrenic and lives in a group home here in Colorado Springs. Do you think he understood what we were going through when Ryan was going through his bipolar? Absolutely. And I don't know many spouses who can live in the shadow of a previous life. He understands the value of us telling the story of our previous life. And he's willing for me to travel all over to do it. And this is Ben. He looks like Liam Helmsworth. <laughs> I think he's so cute. Ben, the voicemail, our youngest son. He's 24 now. He works at Edwards Air Force Base as a contractor on the Global Hawk uh, contract. He graduated from the University of Arizona last year, last summer. So in February of last year, he called me. So you know, I, I kind of clenched a little bit when he called. I said, what's up? He said, Mom, I've gone viral. I said, it's OK. Go to urgent care. You know, they've got some medication for that. <laughs> Mom. I said, what's up? So in high school, he was an athlete. But his counselor said, Ryan, or Ben, take up a mindless hobby to help you when you're in college. So the girl he liked his senior year started a crochet club before school. Mm -hmm. He learned how to crochet. And then he went off to college, and he joined a fraternity, and he became a closet crocheter. So he had a girlfriend his senior year. So last February, he was taking 20 credit hours of aerospace engineering, trying to find a job, waiting for his clearance, because I made him be very honest on his equip for the clearance. He talked about his suicide attempts. He talked about his 72-hour holds. It finally came through. But I said, what happened? He said, I went viral on Twitter and Instagram because his girlfriend broke up with him before he could give her this halter top that he crocheted. And he put that sucker on, and he snapped a selfie, and he put it on Twitter and Instagram, went from 150 followers to almost 30,000 followers, sold the thing for $45 to this young lady. I think she wore it best. And he says, Mom, I have 500 orders for halter top. This hobby I took up to help my anxiety is causing me more anxiety. <laughs> so we talked it through. He taught his frat brothers how to brochet. <laughs> they fulfilled all 500 orders. So the beauty of that is Ben learned new avenues for his talents. I wish he'd been a business major instead of aerospace engineering. <laughs> but his frat brothers learned a mindless hobby to help combat their anxiety and they got some green back in their pockets. I'm very proud of Ben. So I put this up here because we have over 1,500 days of observance. I don't know what today is. I think yesterday was National Lash Day, Eyelash Day, National Drink Wine Day. There's a, a National Ice Cream Day every day in my house, but it's May 17th. I was in shape in high school. I'm A shape now, and my size is TLC, thick like cornbread. Going to the gym does not help me take care of myself. <laughs> but we don't have a National Survivor's Day. So I've been working on this for seven years because I don't take no for an answer. This year, in a couple weeks, I will be in Washington, D.C. It's a joint resolution, National Resilience Day, March, or March 4th. Because no matter what the obstacle, we put one foot in front of the other. And we march forth and conquer. Thank you. So March 4th this year, if you remember nothing else, please just wake up, stand up, hold your head up high, pull your shoulders back, and say, I have survived. I have learned lessons from those brutal tests that I've gone through. 
and I want to help other people with it. And then I want to be your resource. So feel free to take a picture. This is my personal cell phone. After that voicemail, four years ago, I don't turn my cell phone off. And you guys are special, along with everyone else I've presented to. <laughs> but everyone gets my personal cell phone. If there is something I can do for you, let me know. This is all my information. We have two public service announcements that the Air Force has done on our family. The first one is a three minute video and it has a snippet of that voicemail. And I know it's hard to hear and it's powerful, but that's the point. And then the second one was just released from Air University. Use it. If you have something you wanna, somebody you wanna share it with, please use it. But if I can be of any help to you, I don't have all the answers, but I've been through those brutal, cruel, ad adjective in life, and I've learned lessons, and I've fostered relationships with people, even those people who have told me no. But if I can help in any way and point you in the right direction, that's my purpose in life right now. Because we're at war, I don't want to be a stranger to you. But there's no room for strangers and there's no room for silence on this battlefield. And together, we put one foot in front of the other and we march forth and conquer. Thank you. We have time for one question. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Good. <laughs> but I will be here all day and tomorrow, so please feel free. Yes, ma'am. And your name? Okay. Hi. That's a good question. I don't know if you all heard it. She's asking about my spiritual life, what it's been like through day one, and what these adversities um, has, has done or, or helped. Um, and I, I grew up in the church, um, and it's been very, very important for me. I, it hasn't always been a strong faith. <laughs> Sometimes I wish God would bring back their burning bush and just tell me what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> um, but I would probably doubt that, too. Um, but it, for us, it's been very important. Uh, I counted on our chaplains um, to help. When you have someone in your community that can take the emotional aspect out of an adversity for you, grab on to that person. For, for me, that person was our, our pastors, our, our chaplains, and then other people in our community, because our church community played a, a huge part in it. Um, and so I, I am not good at memorizing Bible verses or anything. I know what's in my heart. And there is healing for me telling our story. And if you think about going to the gym and lifting weights, um, lifting adversities, it breaks the muscles and it, they grow back and they grow back stronger. And you go back to the gym and you lift those weights and you break the muscles and they grow back and they grow stronger. And What's the largest muscle in our body? Our heart. Breaks my heart every time hearing that voicemail. But our faith plays a huge part in our, in our story. It's all a story in the harmony of life, right? Not necessarily a balance. We've got lows, we've got highs. But in that harmony, that's the common thread for me through all the tests. Thanks for the question. I appreciate it. Miss Christie, thank you again for your time this morning.
On behalf of our 2020 and CLS participants, the cadet wing, and the faculty and staff for the Air Force Academy, we would like to present you with a small token of our appreciation. Once again, we would like to extend our thanks to the class of 1959, our flagship supporter, the class of 1973, the class of 1974, the class of 1993, the Association of Graduates, the Air Force Academy Foundation, the Falcon Foundation, the John and Lynn Muse Educational Foundation, Earl Enix, class of 1977, and Mrs. Candy Enix, and all those who through their generosity made NCLS possible. <laughs> 